we compost because A, it helps us get rid of stuff, uh, and B, we end up with free stuff as a result of it that we can use, and C, the free stuff we end up with turns out to be the best stuff you can possibly use to grow plants, and so that's why we compost. Um, you know, the question is how to compost, and you know, it's gotten complicated over the years. It used to be you just put stuff down, you put a little bit of brown stuff, a little bit of uh, green stuff, and as long as it was three and a half cubic you know, yards, it would, you know, it would your feed, it would, uh, you know, it would make a nice hot pile. You know, now, people are, uh, you know, 30 to one ratio, this, the other, blah, and it's gotten complicated. So in order to make it easy, what I always tell people when I give my compost lectures, is you use Google. Google is the best friend a composter could ever have. Now you probably don't expect to hear that, but you know, so you're sitting around, you've got newspaper, you've got some rabbit straw, and you've got some alfalfa food, which the rabbit you know, would have eaten, but the rabbit's now dead. And you've got, um, you know, maybe you've got uh, uh, a bunch of old, couple of cases of old lettuce. Well, how do you get 30 to one nitrogen out of that? I mean, how do you figure that out? Well, it turns out now, using wonderful you know, computer situations, you can punch a button and get a compost calculator. So you say that the compost calculator it has inputs. Gee, I've got lettuce, uh, X amount. I've got X amount of you know, alfalfa. I've got rabbit straw. And you push a button, it tells you how much of each to put into the pile in order to get the perfect compost. Pretty amazing. Um, it's, it's really easy to do. Basically, it's brown and green. You mix ba a bag of leaves in, in a 50 pound bag of, uh, you know, of alfalfa meal, and uh, you're gonna end up with compost. Uh, it just happens by itself. Now, the thing that people don't seem to understand is when you start getting compost, you have to continue to turn the pile so that every bit of that pile gets hot. Home gardeners don't generally do that. And oftentimes, they don't get real good compost. They get putrefying matter. That can have some bad consequences, bad stuff in it. So, so you want to make sure that you keep it heated all the time, that you've got enough green and you've got enough brown standing by, that you can add it to the compost pile so that you can keep it going and so that you can get compost. And it shouldn't take all that long. You know, I can make compost in about uh, 21, 22 days if I, if I work it, or if I, if I, if I get my wife to work it. Uh, but uh, compost is something everybody ought to be doing. And if they're not doing compost, a simple worm bin is the way to go. Because you just take the stuff and put it into the worm bin and it makes the compost for you. One's thermal, one's obviously biological. Oh, don't get a rotating tumbler. <laughs> and the reason why I say don't get a rotating tumbler is, is, is answered in the first book, and that's because you're not getting all of the soil food web into your compost. You know, you're getting what you put into the compost bin plus what comes up from the soil underneath the compost bin. So you get worms and beetles and all sorts of stuff work their way into the compost pile from below. If you put it into one of those bins, unless you take a couple of shovels full of soil every now and then, you're not getting the stuff that you really want to have in it. So it come, and it usually comes out kind of wet and sloppy because it's not really the best way to go. Yeah. Well, you know, the compost pile should get hot enough so that the weeds are killed. And, and that's the point about home gardeners. If you're, if you're getting weeds in your compost, you're not getting it hot enough. You know, it's, um, it's, 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 it's pretty simple. You can shred them. You know, some people shred up before they put it in the compost, but, but basically what you wanna do is just get it hotter. And that means you either turn it over more and get some green into it. Uh, and you gotta turn the inside. You know, the inside has, is, is where it's hot. The outside has to go back in. You gotta get every part of it has to be done right, so. The one thing that I don't talk about in the, in the in the second book, but I think it's, it's evident when you read it, and, and that's, it becomes almost sort of a, uh, uh, almost a spiritual kind of thing. When you understand what goes on inside a plant, you can look at a plant differently. And, and in this particular instance, what, what becomes evident after you read the book, I think anyway, at least it did for me, as I researched the book and finally put it all together, that what happens inside a cell is, is, is very analogous to what's happening, say for example, inside this room. I mean, we could, we could just say that this, the cell is just a bigger example of this room. You and I are two enzymes. 
we are, you know, we are taking ideas and we're passing them back and forth and shaping them and, you know, bending them and folding them and, and now, and then we're putting them into a, into a transportation system and infrastructure and sending them out of the cell using these cameras, the microphone, we have signals coming into the room, we've got air coming in through these little holes up and it's the exact same thing as a cell. You take the state of Florida, it's the exact same thing. FedEx does exactly, you know, what happens to the stuff that it comes out of a ribosome. You know, the, where does that protein go? Well, the protein ends up, you know, in, in the endoplasmic reticulum, getting a label put on it and getting shipped off to the right spot. The same thing happens to Florida. In fact, if you take the United States, it acts just like a cell. The infrastructure of the United States connecting the East and the West just the, just the internet lines, when you take a look at them, they look exactly, exactly like the microtubules inside a cell emanating from a nucleus out to the walls. It's unbelievable. And then you take the whole Earth. So it, it, it's sort of like, the, I call it the Horton, here's a who theory of life. And, and you can start with that cell. And after you read that book, you're never really sure whether, maybe we're all just part of a little plant cell here. Yeah. Uh, it all goes back to plants, it all goes back to plants, and eventually it all goes back to soil. That's, that's really the bottom line. And we've got to protect our soil, we've got to treat it so that it can support the soil food web, including those important mycorrhizal fungi, obviously the roots that take up the food so that the plant can eat. It all starts with that soil. Whether it's composting, whether you're adding fertilizers, whether you're adding mulches, it's the soil that counts. That is the basic thing. And if we don't treat our soil better, we're going to end up having a terrible situation. Soil is where the earth holds carbon. Simple as that. Mycorrhizal fungi bring carbon that comes from the air and put it into the soil. That's where about 30% of the carbon that's in the soil comes from. And, and we are losing so much soil every single year, which we will not get back. It's so important in the world, not just the United States, that we start treating our soils like they're alive and like we want to keep them alive. That's sort of the bottom line of all three of the books. They're really all soil books, they're all related, uh, and the message is always the same. You gotta treat the soil right.